are here and have been helping guide this and put it together. And a few quick notes for tonight. This symposium is being live streamed on the UH Energy Facebook pages. We'll post a video of this on our YouTube channel uh, by Monday. This is typically what we do. And so you can see past symposiums on the Facebook uh, uh, or the YouTube pages. We're going to have a Q&A. Let's see, I should be advancing. Oh, it is getting for me. Thank you. Um, with the website here, uh, we will uh, select a number of questions. This will be at the end of it. We'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A. And, and then afterwards, we'll have a reception where, of course, you can finish the Qs and the As that didn't get answered or asked at that time. Uh, we have an audience engagement. And so this is kind of like a little pop quiz as we go along. Uh, it's a Kahoot quiz. Uh, the winner is going to get a prize. And so we have one here. Uh, so tonight, the top prize is an Echo Dot, bringing, bringing AI into your home. And so let's do the quiz. Um, and a reset? No, not yes. Later, we'll be doing the quiz later. So, our moderator tonight is Matt Rogers. He's a senior partner in the McKinsey office in San Francisco. He focuses on the role of technology and innovation in restructuring markets in oil and gas, power, energy, and other industrial companies. He spent more than 25 years with McKinsey in the practice, leaving the oil and gas practice in the Americas. He's written extensively on oil, gas, power, and resource markets. He focuses on North American unconventional resources, restructuring U.S. power markets, and how technology is reshaping or operational efficiency in oil, gas, and power. He also had a stint in uh, public administration with the Department of Energy and, and learning uh, and experiencing firsthand the interface of, of industry and policy um, from both sides. Matt graduated magna cum laude from Princeton, joined Credit Suisse for Boston as an energy investment banking analyst. He earned his MBA from the Yale School of Organization Management. And now, Matt, if you'll take the lead here with the panel. I will get out of the way. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for that uh, kind introduction. This is a uh, terrific uh, event this evening. This is a great audience, uh, both uh, online and here in the room. Uh, and uh, with the audience engagement is super important to make this, uh, this work well. Uh, we have a terrific panel uh, here. We have panels that, as we go through the conversation, I will joke her causing trouble, solving problems, and together actually trying to figure out what the path ahead is for, uh, for the grid. I argued that uh, in my book, Resource Revolution, that uh, Ed mentioned, I argued that this is the most interesting time in 100 years when you look at the utility industry and at the grid and what's going on. And so hopefully a few of you that are engineers are going to get inspired as we go through the conversation today to solve some of the core problems, because these are problems that the industry didn't have to deal with literally for the last 100 years. They had some really hard time from sort of 1875 to 1925 to figure out how it all worked. And then it kind of worked for a while. And now we've got to reinvent and figure out how to solve uh, some, new, uh, some new challenges. As I frame it up for our conversation, what is fascinating is just how much a simple thing like the grid can change in what has been a relatively short, uh, short period of time. We go from a world where power came from a central station power plant and went to an end user in a unidirectional uh, fashion. Indeed, if you go back to the original power plants, they really went from a power plant straight to downtown. Now we sort of have a network and it, it goes to the, oh, but it was a unidirectional flow. We had a centralized bulk power system with big central station uh, sources. We, we had dispatchable uh, generation sources. So every time you turned on a light, a power plant got a little bit hotter. Right? It, it moved up and down in direct response to, uh, to demand. And generation was the capacity that we had uh, on the system. That was the way the system was designed, frankly, by Edison and Tesla and Westinghouse and those guys back at the end of the 19th century. And it's worked really, really well. People <coughs> talk about that as the great engineering achievement of the 20th century. And now we're in the 21st century, and we're running the, this thing that we put together, the greatest engineering achievement 
for 100 years. And now we're running it fundamentally differently. We're running bidirectional flow. If you have solar on your rooftop, you're putting power back into the system, potentially more hours than you're taking power off of the system. How does that work? We've got distributed resources now. So instead of having central stations that flow into a city, we got resources all over the city. I told uh, um, in 2009, I went to the Edison uh, um, Electric Institute annual meeting, and I said the challenge of running the grid is going to increase by a factor of 10 to the 9th. Because if you just look at the number of, of pieces that want to get onto the grid at any point in time, that's how, how much we're going to see change. And in fact, we're not quite 10 to the 9th, but we're probably about 10 to the 6th over the last decade in terms of, of complexity of the system. We now have intermittent generation resources. It used to be really good. I turned on a light. I had a power plant. Those things worked really to get well together. And now we have a whole set of things that when, the, when a, uh, a cloud comes across or the wind drops, we have very different uh, um, responses on the system. And now we have things like batteries on the system at scale. And is a battery a generation source or is it a demand source? And is it capacity generates and the generation is capacity? And you ask the regulators in the United Kingdom and they still don't know what to do. <laughs> and so those are the core challenges that, uh, that we face. And as we go, we can, you know, there's all, what it means is we're going to instrument the entire grid. We're going to instrument it in whole new ways from end to end. And we'll talk some about the instrumentation that's there today and the instrumentation that's going to be needed as we, as we go forward. You're going to need all kinds of new data. We need it in much finer increments. We need it in many more places in order to make this work. So all of you who are good at data analysis and machine learning, it's not a bad place to go to figure out actually how to run the system. Um, and we're going to change the physical infrastructure. We're going to put a lot of software on the grid and write a whole new set of code for how to make this work. We're going to actually create new markets. We're going to, we, we talk about grid historically was a a piece of equipment, and now it's going to be a service or a market, and how does that work? And, and it's going to change processes and people uh, throughout, the, throughout the system. Um, and we're going to think about it not in terms of some great system average, but we're going to think about it in particular nodes where there's big congestion. Any day uh, in San Francisco at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the price difference uh, um, across 200 miles can be 5x every day. And that's a very different system than one which, which has a uniform, evenly distributed price at every point uh, in, the, in the system. And, and so we've had a whole set of working sessions that comes out of New York where we have had conversations about all of the things that need to change. And the only point about this chart is there's a lot of stuff that needs to change in order to set up the system uh, right as we go forward. And so as we go through the conversation, I think we're going to have uh, four or five topics that I'll, I'll try to keep us coming back to. The, the first is that this idea that grid was equipment and now it's a service. And how is grid as a service and how does that really work and who is actually going to pay for that and how does that work? Um, for all of you engineers, uh, the way that a circuit is designed on the power grid from 1970, which is basically what we use today, not going to work a decade or two from now? What's a new circuit going to look like that integrates storage and integrates demand response and integrates solar uh, all in the, the context of a safe, reliable, affordable uh, grid? We're going to talk about uh, the states that are running lots of innovation programs, but uh, what are we learning from the different innovation uh, and trials that are going on out there? We're going to talk about a market that needs a trillion dollars of new investment over the next 15 years. One trillion dollars has to go into the grid. Again, if you want a job for the next 15 or 20 years, not a bad uh, thing to be in an industry that requires a trillion dollars to go in. But in order to make all this work, we're going to have to have a new set of rules and a new set of governance. Because it used to be that the way it ran was this, the utility actually created an integrated model where you could, in fact, have all the rules internalized within the company. And now we have lots of folks who want to get onto the grid, and we have to have a set of rules by which that, uh, that operates, or else the whole system doesn't, uh, doesn't work. So I think that's the, the sort of frame uh, for today. And we've got a set of terrific speakers who are going to go into a lot more uh, detail uh, than I uh, can here. We're going to start with, uh, with Jesse Grossman, who founded Soltage in 2006, serves as the chairman and CEO. 
with a BA in biology from Carleton and a master's in environmental science from the Yale School of Forestry. We're then going to go to the uh, grid operator uh, himself, to Kenny Mercado, <coughs> who is the SVP for uh, Centerpoint Energy, responsible for the operation across 5,000 square miles, 2.4 million homes, and actually making sure that when you turn that light on, it actually works. Every day, rain, snow, not that much snow down here, just a little <laughs> bit, uh, but a good bit of sunshine and a little bit of wind and rain as we go through. Um, and, and Kenny has a BA and, and a master's, a BA in, in uh, electrical engineering, a master's degree in industrial engineering from here at the University of Houston. So big shout out for the University of Houston here. Uh, and an executive MBA from the University of Texas. And then we're going to go to John Berger. Uh, and John co-founded Sonova in 2012. John is a great serial entrepreneur. Previously, he co-founded and was CEO of Suncap Financial and helped start Standard Renewable Energy. This ability to create one company after the next in a growing market is, is quite remarkable. BA in civil engineering from Texas A&M and an MBA from the Harvard uh, Business School. So with that, why don't I turn it over to Jesse and he can start us down the path. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be here and really appreciate the invite and the opportunity to be talking uh, with such a great looking audience online and uh, online and, uh, and in person about these really important issues. I think we're going to have a really interesting uh, conversation here today. Make sure I can get this clicker out here. So my name is Jesse Grossman. I'm the CEO and founder of Soltage. And I've been doing this for over a decade. And so you've seen quite a bit in this marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about that. First off, I'll frame quickly what Soltage is. So Soltage is an IPP. And consider us sort of one of the utility companies or a generation entity of the future. Uh, we develop, own, and operate large solar farms across the US. We've got solar farms in 15 states across the US generating power feeding into hospitals, municipalities, large commercial entities, etc. We put around half a billion dollars into the marketplace over those years in terms of fundamental investment into these assets that we're then managing for the long term for our shareholders. So that's, that's what we do uh, across the U.S. I'm going to talk less about what we do in the rest of my talk today, which I'll try to keep relatively short so we've got a good amount of time for Q&A, will really be about you know, where has this market come you know, where are we right now relative to solar penetrating the grid and other technologies? What are the trends for the future? And then what are some of the key ways that uh, the markets that we work in are getting unlocked to allow for greater and greater penetration by renewables, solar, wind, and, uh, and others? So we'll just go right through. So quickly, a little bit of history, right? Where have we been and what have been the trends? Here we go back to around the middle of the century and you can see really, you know, the trends um, I think we're all quite aware of. You know, this country was really um, powered for a long time by coal. And coal was really the dominant, uh, the dominant um, source of production of power uh, in this country. Although over the last couple of years, it's been you know, relatively um, quickly subsumed by increases in natural gas and renewable energy. And natural gas has really been driven by technology increases in terms of fracking and vertical drilling, horizontal drilling rather. And, um, and renewable energy has been driven by two things, both related to cost. Cost of capital, money has been very cheap recently. And then cost of the equipment. Cost of the equipment has fundamentally declined by orders of magnitude since I started this business 12 years ago. Um, in you know coming to a more sort of temporal t period of time, we got the last couple of years here, and you can see that um, you know the black bars on the bottom are solar, and then you've got natural gas there, you've got wind and um, and others on the top. Note, you know you're not really seeing coal represented in terms of new capacity additions after 2013, and even then it was quite small. And in the last couple of years, it's been over 50% of new capacity additions have been natural gas and renewables for those two reasons. Um, and in two of these quarters, this is broken out on an annual basis, but in two of the recent quarters, um, solar was actually the number one capacity addition in the US. So I think we're really seeing some you know, pretty clear trends that are emerging relative to how we are fundamentally, to that point, transforming our energy economy here. Um, but again, this is still the, the, the early days of it. Um, and this uh, is showing both retirements and additions 
This is an EIA uh, government study that, um, that I think really kind of summarizes um, both what's been happening and then the perspective look where you can see that, you know, the trends that we talked about with uh, renewables and natural gas being a pretty large component of the recent um, new capacity additions and then retirements, which are the, uh, the, the, the bars below this line here, representing, you know, a number of the coal plants that we've got still operating are coming to their end, end, end of useful life. You know, folks are terming those out and there's refurbishments. But at some point, right, there's a lot of moving parts there and those just do need to come off the grid. Ditto with the nukes that were all put online in the 1970s. Those were all coming off the grid sort of regionally around the country, leaving, you know, multiple gigawatts of capacity holes that do need to be filled. And those are being filled by the technologies that, that we're going to be talking about today, renewables and how they're, how they're getting into the grid. And as you go out here, this is sort of perspective, and nobody really has a true crystal ball of what 2040 is going to look like. But, you know, even if these trends are directionally correct, you're seeing, you know, it's 100% uh, natural gas and, um, and solar with wind in the next couple of years. Those are going to continue to be developed. There's a lot of offshore opportunities that, it, that are being built out right now. Uh, but then those, those, those areas are going to be tapped out, and there's essentially a finite uh, number of areas of those, even with technology improvements. So that, those are kind of some of the trends. Now, stepping back from that into the world where I sort of live and breathe on a daily basis, um, solar, I'll get a little bit more specific about, about um, why we're excited about this space and what are some of the key areas of the uh, economy and regulatory environment that are allowing solar to progress so quickly and why, you know, again, echoing one of Matt's points, this is a great space to be in. And for all those that are in the finance space, engineering space, operations space, there's going to be plenty of open seats for you over the next couple of years and decades to really make a good career here. Um, you know, just a couple of stats that I'll pull out of here. There was over 11 gigawatts of new solar added in 2017. 2018 is also going to be a banner year, but that's a pretty remarkable number. Um, $15 billion were put in just to the primary investment into solar. Um, and uh, also, that's a, that's a pretty dramatic number. You know, the compound annual growth rates in the U.S. have been really lovely. Um, that said, this is an interesting graph, but let's put this into um, sort of the, the reality that solar is still only around 3% of penetration in the U.S. And so we've been growing very quickly from a small base. And therefore, you could say, you know, compound annual growth rates are pretty remarkable. But it's the next 10 years and the next 20 years that I'm, I'm really excited about sort of running a company in this space. Um, and let's talk about, you know, quickly three areas that I want to discuss that are allowing for solar, um, sort of they've both been pushing solar forward and pulling it. Um, so you get kind of push-pull dynamics from, from the topics I'm going to discuss right now. The first is investment. Um, solar has turned out to be a phenomenal investment for like all across the capital stack, whether you're coming in on equity, you're coming in debt, you're coming in mess, you're investing in corporate areas. You know, there have been some uh, interesting, notable um, you know, losers in this space. But by and large, um, you know, this is a great area to invest in. It's low risk. It's a real asset investment. And, you know, you can really dial in the credit properties to, to achieve your risk reward um, ratio as an investor. Um, you know, the positive attributes, and we raise a lot of money. We raise funds to, to invest in solar. So we're not only developing solar assets, but we're developing investment vehicles that are investing in solar. And so this is exciting stuff for us to talk about. And we talk to investors about the contracted cash flows, the stability of the yields, the lack of correlation to the broader markets. You know, the stock market could be going up, down, could be going haywire, bond market, interest rate environment could be changing. But the contracted cash flows from these solar assets, it's somewhat like flipping a coupon. That's very interesting um, to a lot of institutional investors. And have they've seen the track record of solar investment over the last couple of years. And they've been pleased. And so they write bigger and bigger checks. And so it's incumbent upon us and the regulators to do what we can to grow the market sustainably to allow for that, uh, those greater dollars to, to come into place. Um, and then the investment products are available really across the capital stack. You know, there's tax equity. I'll talk a little bit about some of those structures. Uh, debt at the project level is uh, there's opportunities there. Just common equity, sponsor equity is another um, component in these deals. There's a lot of sort of mezzanine hybrid products for um, sort of smaller groups that are looking to place interesting types of capital into special situations and, and get, uh, get a return out of there. And then, you know, on the public side, um, you know, there are, there are plenty of options now for publicly traded solar companies, um, public offerings of securities, you know, bonds, um, yield co-vehicles, et cetera 
that uh, that you know John Q. Public can invest in, and that's uh, that's also very interesting. Um, I'm putting up an interesting org chart here. Uh, we spend a lot of our time on the financing of solar, and for any of you who are taking economics or finance or project finance classes or any one of Ed's classes, um, you know this might look somewhat familiar to you. But it's a, it's a typical you know, solar project financing diagram. And I'm not going to de delve into it, um, except to say that this is how sort of equity, for one, uh, comes in, how tax equity can come in at the asset co level, and how debt can come in at the project level and fund those. And those are opportunities for you know, banks, insurance companies, pension funds to all get involved in the growth of this, uh, this energy infrastructure sector. You know, th this has resulted in a lot of large institutions making you know big announcements and putting large dollars into this space and there's a nice green component to this but i will tell you it's a very few investors that i've talked with over the years that are interested in investing in this space just for green credentials and to say you know i'm doing something good because it's good for the environment that's that's a nice to have but if there was a better yield or a better return to be had in a safer model somewhere else you know the, the money would be there <coughs> so i think it's really remarkable that you know names like bank of america jp morgan chase Prudential, who's uh, located down here, does quite a lot in the renewable sector. They're all writing big checks and looking to looking to get into this uh, part of the energy infrastructure in a big way. So that's that's finance, that's capital, that's how that's getting involved and really helping to you know both push the market forward and pull products through that can be forward investment products. The second area that um, I want to briefly touch on is regulation. Um, you know, the regulation of the energy markets is very important in terms of sending signals to asset developers and asset owners of where you can do, where you can do business, fundamentally. Um, some of these regulatory policies that we spend a lot of time thinking about are net metering. Um, Matt was talking about bi-directional flow of the grid. And you need to be allowed to put a solar asset in an area and then feed that power onto the grid. We do a lot of ours. You know, we started doing a lot of behind-the-meter assets sort of on the roof of uh, projects. Now, more frequently, we're doing a landfill or a hundred acre of a solar farm, you know, in the middle of nowhere, but you need to get uh, the right interconnection from the grid and you need to get, you know, net metering policies so that you're able to actually send your power onto the grid um, at points where you're producing. So that regulatory, that regulation is very interesting. And what I find notable about this uh, map behind me is that this is not a homogenous map. And there's a lot of different colors, which correspond to quality of the net metering regulations, quality of those programs, and you can see how this would make for a very <coughs> fractured market with a lot of sort of individual opportunities, but not something where you can go and apply the same sort of strategy to every single market. That makes it challenging. That's one of the reasons why we're only at 3% solar across the US. And that's one of the areas where I think will be very important for folks like us, regulators across the states, you know, lobbyists, large companies, et cetera, that want to see more solar invested in faster to help normalize some of these policies across the country in ways that work for the existing transmission owners, work for new asset development, developers, et cetera. Um, a couple other points of uh, regulation. One is community solar. Community solar is one of the, one of the more interesting new ways of selling power from, uh, from solar assets. Um, I trust some folks here have residential solar panels on their roof or know somebody that does in their neighborhood. And we think that's great. And we, we really um, appreciate that. And, and that business is growing like gangbusters and, and doing very well. That said, you know, there's only a fraction. And someone told me 20%. That sounds like too round of a number. But only around, you know, I'll, but I'll use it. Um, only 20% of the structures across the U.S. can actually hold solar panels on top of them. So for the other 80% of power users that are turning on TVs, you know, having alarm clocks, et cetera. How do they engage with the solar market? How do they buy kilowatt hours of solar power? Community solar is a way that um, the market has evolved to, to provide for that and answer that question. And that allows for, you know, residential or commercial entities to essentially sign up to buy solar that's not physically adjacent to them. So they could be buying from a solar farm five miles away or 10 miles away and getting a lot of those benefits that solar is able to provide. Stabilized power costs, saving money from day one. Um, and again, you see a very uneven tapestry of regulatory Im implementation of that. And so that's something that you know we hope and we need to have worked on to have that sort of more normalized across the US over the coming years. 
Um, finally, and this is, uh, somebody wanted to mix up the colors uh, quite in an interesting and dramatic manner for this one. This is um, an interconnection. And this was from a study called Freeing the Grid. And you know, how easy is it to interconnect in various states? If I've got a 2 megawatt or a 20 megawatt asset, and I want to connect it to the larger transmission and distribution system, is it straightforward? Is it difficult? And they did some ranking. I'm not sure exactly how they did this. Ranking states A through F. And you can see, you know, in the light blue color, there's some A's, you know, largely where you'd expect them to be um, in, in some of the more deregulated markets. But then in a lot of the regulated markets where there's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, you can, you can tell it's a little harder for independent generators to, uh, to get interconnected. And so that's, I think, another, another component. Finally, uh, technology and technology advancement is another one of the, the parts of the market that's really going to be driving, has driven this market forward and will continue to drive the market forward. Now, I'm not expecting anyone to read this set of, you know, lines here behind me. But I think the direction is what's important here. These are various types of solar modules, various technology flavors, you know, various um, configurations of you know, the commonly utilized solar panels that we've seen you know, around over the last um, 25 years. And you can see that you know, efficiencies, while on an annual basis you haven't seen any step changes with very steep slopes, what you've seen is a gradual continuation in efficiency, uh, in efficiency increase um, on, on, on the module levels. And that's great. And effectively, that means you're getting more power density out of the same unit area. Um, and that's something I think very important in a good way that the, the market has been going and will continue. Finally, energy storage. And we don't have time at, at this point, um, and uh, we're keeping our remarks short to kick off the panel discussion, to really give energy storage its, uh, its, its due uh, discussion in this form. But this is something that's really pulling forward um, that 3% to a 10%, 20%, 80% number. Solar is an intermittent resource. All right? The sun's not shining. Our solar plants are currently not producing any power, not flowing any electrons onto the grid. And so that really limits what we can do. We're kind of shaving some peaks here and there. They're big peaks. we got a lot to do. But at some point, we want to be able to provide baseline, stable resources for uh, the power consumers of the U.S. And to do that, we need batteries. We need storage. And um, storage technology, you know, everything is, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going to the lithium side right now. You know, that's been pushed forward through the cell phones in your pockets and the EV vehicles that we're now seeing driving around the streets. There's other technologies that are coming out there which are very well suited for the power sector. Um, some of the flow batteries are very interesting, and, and we've been reading a lot about those recently. And that's something, you know, watch this space. They're coming, and they're going to be coming in increasing numbers. Um, you know, this is sort of the investment, cumulative global investment that is being expected um, in battery storage market alone. You can see, you know, 17 to 20, we're talking only about $6.7 billion. But um, towards the end of uh, next decade, you know, that five-year period should have $100 billion of investment in battery. And again, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, I think, you know, the kickoff speaker and myself would like to convey is we're right in the sort of front end of the, the transformation of our energy economy. And it's, a, it's an interesting place. You know, it almost feels like we're, we're turning a, the pages of a book that has been written, and we're on, you know, page 10 out of a, out of a, out of a sort of a Moby Dick-sized novel. So this is, this is very interesting. Um, you know, this is going to be playing out, you know, across, uh, across our country, across our neighborhoods, across our utilities. And, um, and it probably can't happen soon enough because, you know, as we're seeing, you know, there's a lot going on with the climate. There's a lot more intensity of storms, um, and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and, and we can use a lot more jobs that are associated with this industry. And so, uh, you know, pleased to be part of it. So I will stop there and uh, turn it over to my next panelist, and thank you all for your time. Okay. My name is Kenny Mercado with Centerpoint, and I want to really appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be here tonight. I would think that 10 years ago, if we'd had this topic, this room would have been empty. And today, <laughs> this room is full, so it's pretty exciting to see you all here. Two things I was going to mention before I get started. Uh, one, the Astros got rained out tonight, so you can relax and sit back and enjoy the evening. <laughs> Two, my wife's birthday is today, and I cannot relax. I have to go home and celebrate with her when this, when this evening is over, so I'll do my best to Stay with you. 
Um, so is the grid. I'm, I'm a grid guy. I've been in this business for quite a, quite a number of years, and, and I have a few, few stories to share over my career. But is it a gridlock? Uh, is it a renewed uh, asset? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that th during your questions tonight. I couldn't be more thrilled to be in this space that today than ever. Uh, and, and I kind of feel s sad that my, my career is starting to come down to the very end, and you have all these young engineers who are just beginning, and you're going to be able to do things uh, exponentially more powerful than I was able to do in my lifetime. So the, the future is bright for our, our younger students in business and in engineering and in operations. So just briefly, our, our company, Centerpoint Energy, we're home right here in Houston, Texas. We're a large utility. We serve electrically. We serve Houston, Texas, 2.4 million customers. We've been through it all. We've been through Ike, Harvey, everything in between. We know how to handle uh, big events, and we do them the best of, to our ability. Uh, we also own the gas uh, d distribution business here in Houston. Uh, but we're serving eight states. We'll be, uh, within a sh in a short period of time, we'll be buying another utility that serves Indiana and Ohio. I'm very excited about that and looking forward to the, the future opportunities in our business. Uh, so we have three big businesses. Electric, uh, regulated electric distribution and transmission is one. Gas distribution, regulated gas distribution is two. And then we do energy services, gas sales, gas services, and gas construction. So all three businesses are very important to us in the big picture over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, so the electric network of the future, you heard this earlier from Matt. I think he nailed it. It's going to be more complicated. If I have to put one word in, into play here, I'd say complicated is, is, is a big piece of this. Our grid is, is good, and our grid is going to continue to get better. Uh, but it has a responsibility now that's a lot different with all the assets that are now becoming more dynamic, more digital, uh, on the demand side as well on the supply side, the, the wires have to be able to operate uh, with, with the changes that occur in real time during the day, during the evenings, during the summertime, during the wintertime, and also during the, the shoulder months where your renewables are uh, producing at a, at a very high, high output. So we've got to be able to do it and do it in all, do it in all, all uh, different types of situations. But what you're seeing here, though, is a more of an emphasis of away from the large coal plants of the past. We're seeing many plants retire, uh, and we're moving more towards renewable supplies of power to serve our grids, as well as natural gas, and as well as smaller, localized, distributed types of, of uh, assets. All that's happening right now. I can share all kinds of stories with you about the real-time experiences. And for the most part, it's working very, very well. Our technology is ready, and, and the types of systems that are being uh, brought onto the grid are working at a, at a very high reliability place. So here in, in this diagram, you see storage, you see distributed generation, you see rooftop generation, rooftop solar, you see uh, batteries, you see it all, you see electric vehicles, you see demand management, you see all these activities through the, through the advent of new technologies that are really driving at a, at a rapid pace, driving the, sort of what we should be as engineers planning uh, for the next five to ten years into the future. Um, key influences, you know, you got the Amazon, you have the Google, you have the Apple, you have all these guys. They're driving customer expectations. Customers are getting spoiled, right? We're, we're, you all, we're all getting spoiled. We want everything. We want it right now. We want to see it. We want to, we want to touch it. We want it delivered to our house. We want everything at a very high uh, level of expectations. So, so the customers are driving new demands. They, they, they not only want backup generation, they want active uh, active generation that can work in real time. They don't want it to just work when something goes bad. They want it to be operating in parallel as well as to support their, their, their local needs. Um, most of our customers today have very power sensitive equipment. So the quality of the delivery of energy becomes even more important today than it has been in the past. And if we make an error in power quality, that creates all other, all other types of problems. So we're having a higher expectation on power quality. Electric vehicles are growing probably as fast as any other technology today all across the U.S., in particular California, Florida, Northeast, and even here in Texas. And so how are we doing our job to enable the uh, changes that are occurring in transportation is another big piece of this. Uh, and then on the technology side, microgrids, battery storage, new ways of thinking about serving more locally, especially in an environment where resiliency becomes bigger and bigger over time. Uh, as well, you see big data. We, we in particular, are, are huge data, data system, many applications that we use from big data. And we're getting more and more uh, activity with drones, and drones are providing all different types of services that provide value to our customers, but also provide value 
valuable uh, source of benefit to our assets and maintaining our assets. So the markets out there today, you heard uh, the talk earlier about the markets. The markets matter. Uh, you have, I think you have four general markets in the U.S. today. You have the California market, you have the New York market, market. You have the regulated vertical utility markets, and then you have Texas. And uh, we love Texas. We love Texas. And you're going to hear me say that over and over again because we love Texas. But everybody outside of Texas doesn't always love Texas. So um, our Texas market is what I know best. The California market is pretty high, pretty high, high cost, large investments. Some investments may be ready today, may be ready in the future. Um, so you, you see a, a bigger issue around renewables and, and storage and, and things on a faster pace that are regulated and driven by the, the commission. New York has, has their own discipline around how they make investments uh, from, at their own pace and their own manner. But in Texas, it's a market-driven environment. What that means is wholesale supply can compete any day, any moment, and at any time uh, in, our, in our market, and the demand matters. So the supply is always looking for a, the right deal, whether it's low price or, or high renewables or somewhere in between. Demand is always searching for the right deal to, to serve their needs. And so the satisfied customer in Texas is a little bit different than a satisfied cu customer in other parts of the country because of the products and services they can get in the open market. And that's one of the real differentiators that we have in Texas that we're very proud of. Uh, also, Texas, of course, is the leader. It is the leader in renewables today. Largest supplier of wind, over 20,000 20, megawatts, 20 gigawatts of supply in capacity today. It's still growing. Uh, a couple of gigs of, of supply of renewables, and that, that will that will twofold uh, for the next probably five plus years. We anticipate a lot more solar across the state of Texas. So the renewable supply in this, this state continues to be the leader, not only in the U.S., but also all across, across the world. So what is CenterPoint doing? We're just working hard to digitize our grid. We were one of the first, thanks to some help from uh, my partner here, we were one of the first to put digital, digital meters in. If you live in Houston, you've been living with the digital meter for about 10 years. It works extremely well. It's very accurate. It's very smart. And then we then we, we level we level levelize that that technology with an intelligent grid. It's a platform that we use that enables our crews and our operators to uh, quickly and efficiently and safely get power back on whenever there's an event out there in the real world. Our meters then tell us when there's a power out, and we do not need a call from our customers. We'll send a message to you with our power alert service that says power is off. Power will be on in an estimate of about two hours. And if something fails. Or we'll, we'll uh, give you an update and try to give you as much accurate information as we can through the use of our intelligent grid. Uh, and so today, our, our, our employees and our assets and our technologies and our processes are much more intelligent than they were 10 years ago. And as young engineers and young operators, this is the exciting time about being grid operators. So the grid now today, our job is to modernize it. We make big investments. We're making big investments in our transmission system. You may not know this. Houston is a large, large load center. It serves about 18,000 megawatts of load, one of the largest loads in America. Most of that load used to come from localized generation, from coal and nuclear places near the center of Houston. But over the last 30 years, much of that generation has retired. And so more and more of the power that is demanded in Houston is shipped here from other parts of the state. So we're becoming more dependent on imports of power into our grid. And so we own the transmission that integrates into Houston and serves our system. And so the reliability of Houston's load is, is designed based on this, this, the success and the hardening of our transmission access, uh, access into the greater Houston area. And so that continues to be a big theme as our grow, load grows. Um, but we also have to be resilient. We have to be able to, we have to, be able to uh, deal with Mother Nature. And Mother Nature is not kind, as you see in North Carolina today and Hurricane Harvey last year. And so we are getting new benchmarks every year about high winds and heavy rains. And we have to be resilient to not have issues in those major events. And so we continue to work to raise our infrastructure and protect our infrastructure and harden our infrastructure year over year over year. We continue to work hard to make the grid better and more modern to serve all the complexities that we have today and then tomorrow. So in closing, you know, we're, we're here to deliver tomorrow's services today. We want to be focused on demand and serving the demand. This, the great city of Houston and, and the great state of Texas, we're growing. We're growing and we continue to grow. We're one of the most 
economic places in, in the country. And as we grow, we, we want to be there. We don't wait. We want to be proactively ready for our customers as they grow. We want to have focus on reliability. We want to have focus on resiliency. We want to provide products and services that meet the customer needs behind the meter whenever they think that there needs even a deeper level of resiliency. And we want to be able to provide satisfied customers, uh, not only today but into the future. And that becomes more challenging as the sophistication level increases with our large commercial and our large industrial customers. So we have to be better prepared to meet those levels of sophistication. And with that, I'll stop and we'll come back with questions a little bit later. Thank you very much. John. Good evening, everyone. Now it is Kahoot quiz time. If you would pull out your phones. We do have a prize for the winners. We have six questions based on tonight's topic. You guys can put the slide up. You need to go to kahoot.it. That's K-A-H-O-O-T. Kahoot. .it. It's going to come up in a second. the live feed. Okay. We're patiently waiting for them to change the slide. <laughs> okay, is it not working? There we go. Okay, there it is. Pull it up, Luke. Okay. If you would go to kahoot.it and punch in this code, we'll give everyone a few seconds. All right, you'll punch in your name and you'll see your name come up on the screen. All right, we've got over 200 here today, so we should have that many playing, I hope. All right, we've got six questions, speed and accuracy both count, so keep that in mind as you're answering. Okay, we'll give you about a few more seconds. Slowly but surely. <laughs> okay, let's get it started. We can start, guys. All right, I'm here we go. Are you ready? First question. Which country invested the most in renewable energy in 2017? All right, you'll have 20 seconds to answer. And the correct answer is China. Let's see who our winner was on that one. Okay. Go on to the next question. What is the market environment in Texas for emerging energy technologies? I should get that one right. <laughs> you better get that one right. <laughs> Some of it. If you weren't paying if you pay attention. attention to the presentation, you should get these correct. <laughs> Here we go. And let's see who our winner was on that one. You guys were listening. <laughs> All right, next question. Which of the following is a key factor in the grid of the future? Uh oh, you should get this one right. <laughs> Sure about the China one though. The China one, I don't have to challenge that. I don't really pay attention. And thank you, Matt. By direction there we go. Of power. Next question. Jerry at least read all of them. All right, G got two right. We're on a roll here, whoever G is. Next question. How many megawatts of solar capacity came online in the U.S. in 2017? I was on page two. 
Which one? Oh, yeah. Oh, did they? Correct answer is 11,800. Let's see who got that one. Oh, oh, who is he's he? not? <laughs> hmm, next question, please. According to Grossman, <laughs> what is the total projected storage investment or projected value of energy take, storage take, take that investments home. by 2050? And the correct answer is $550 billion. Next. Who's, who got that one correct? G. Uh, Not G this time. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Our, this is our final question. What attributes will the grid of the future have? Last question. Okay, and our answer is all of the above. Who got that one right? Smart class. Our winner. <laughs> <laughs> well, good job. Congratulations to our winner. Um, if, come see me on stage when the symposium ends, and I have a nice prize for you. So and now we will go with our more last speaker, Mr. Faster. John Berger. I guess so. Yeah. Speed matters. <laughs> no, I don't have anything to give away. <laughs> uh, but he got them all right. Tough act to follow. Uh, that and Kenny. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of talking about the history of the grid, I think Matt's done a great job of that. Um, Mr. Grossman, Kenny. Uh, but, you know, I think in terms of setting up our Q&A session, Pull this. Oh, it's just not coming up. Okay. Um, if I can set up our Q and A session here in a little bit, uh, I do believe Matt wanted to have a little bit of fireworks, uh, have a little bit more of a debate, and plus I want to make sure everybody in the back is is waking up. I know it's evening, and uh, you guys got dinner or, or beers on the mind. So I want to challenge the idea that there's a a forethought in terms of where we're going to go. As, as, a, as a grid, but more importantly, maybe it doesn't surround the grid. Maybe it's just as a, where are we going as an industry? So briefly, when you look at all the history of the U.S. power industry that, again, uh, all those previous speakers have, have spoken about, so I'm not going to rehash all that, basically, up until solar and with now batteries, everything really had to either be, it was centralized fuel, you may think about the very first power plant that Matt referenced earlier. That was Niagara Falls, and then you had the steam generators, and you distributed out the power. All the way, if you think about it, all the way through coal. In fact, the 20s, it was coal by, uh, coal by wire was the rallying cry. Then you get into the nuclear. You've, yes, you've had oil fire generation. You have gas fired and so forth. But the fuel source was centralized. And the conversion technology due to the efficiency was centralized, just as Kenny said earlier, until solar. Solar is a decentralized technology. It's a decentralized fuel. It's a decentralized conversion technology. It is the same panel that I have on my customers' roofs, and we now have uh, over 60,000 residential customers across the United States, from Guam, Saipan, Puerto Rico, to Texas, to Massachusetts. And it is the same battery technology that we now have in our customers' garages. And last year when I was here, I couldn't have said that to you. So it is a decentralized technology, and this is why we're up here. I think there has been various references to, you know, Kenny, I think you're a lot younger than, than that. You're going to be around here to see these, uh, to see these <laughs> things happen. But it, there's a lot of reference to, hey, you, you wouldn't have had this conversation 10 years ago. And they're right. You wouldn't have had the same conversation even last year than you're having this year. And so that's what creates a lot of excitement of what's going on. When you look at the solar industry, 
pre-2017, and really still the majority of our customers coming online, it is what we call just solar. We slap panels on somebody's roof, we put inverters in the garages, and frankly, we swing off the utility system, including Kenny's. Kenny still provides the service. Really don't have that many customers in Houston yet, Kenny, but we will, we'll get there. But in, in, his, in terms of his compatriots, the other monopolies around the country, that's what's happened in the past. Now, in the last year, and really the last two years, what we've done is add a simple battery to it. Puerto Rico, now 100% of our customers have batteries. There's an attachment rate of roughly 20, 25% uh, in California, and then the islands like Hawaii and so forth in the Pacific, they have 100% attachment rates for, for energy storage as well. But it's very early stages. But we'll get to it here in a minute how fast this whole thing's moving. But it's fairly, it's fairly kind of just, you stuck a battery with the solar panels. Yes, you're not using net metering, if at all, very much anymore, but it's not intelligent. It doesn't embrace this demand and the supply side to move to what we call smart solar and storage. And the middle piece here, you can see, is going to be relatively brief, relatively quick, because those technologies, those control technologies that are coming out, all the buzzwords, AI and so forth, they're hitting the market in the next few months in the next few quarters, and we're starting to bring those technologies to our customers as well as I think our competitors will do. And we're integrating all those technologies together, solar, batteries, control electronics, and we're managing each home, think of it as a nano grid. And that is a term that you're going to start to hear a lot, mark my words. Next year, you'll say, oh yeah, nano grid. We've been hearing about that a lot. It's starting to come up there and think about that we're a service provider operating as a utility, our customer's nano grid. And that could include gensets that are natural gas fired. It could even include fuel cells. The Japanese have over 200,000 fuel cells in the, uh, in the field. And that's one of the reasons why I think Centerpoint made a great deal there with Vectrum. It was a smart move. Now, let's talk about the pace. I think this is a human psychology moment. And what I mean by that is if I had to go back in school, I would have taken a lot more psychology classes that would have prepared me more for the world, not only being married, but certainly in the business world. <laughs> and with that, we all tend to think in linear fashion. The, the question that was thrown out there, what does batteries look like in 2050? I have no idea. I guess, I guess Mr. Grossman does, but I have no idea and neither does really anybody else. That's so far out there. And we think about things and look at these forecasts, we think in linear fashion. Oh yeah, it goes like this. But you know what? In the history of mankind, there's no technology that's ever followed a linear curve. Zero. It's all an S curve. If you look here on the solar side of things, that's an S curve. It's going exponential. And you look here on batteries, this is an actual slide I showed my board last board meeting. This is actual numbers of storage in the United States. We've experienced this exponential growth. And I told them, if I had sent this up to you and asked you to approve this budget, you would have asked me to spend some time with you afterwards by, my, by myself. You basically would throw me off out of the CEO seat. You can't, most people just can't think that way. But yet, that's what happens. Think about the smartphone. Think about this uh, st uh, statistic. Amazon is now <laughs> worth more than the entire E&P oil and gas sector in the United States. <coughs> Exxon, Chevron, throw them all in there. It's worth more than that. Apple's worth more. App both those companies are worth 2x the entire electric utility market cap in the United States. Wow. Apple was almost dead. We have a famous Texan that... Uh, Claim that they should have just mailed it in and gone home, right? It shows that technologies move quickly, that things happen fast, that you better get out of school, not only to pay the debt off, but to come work here before you miss it. <laughs> things are going to have, have been happening quick, and they will accelerate. And what's interesting about this market, it's on the margin pricing. What I mean by that, you think that pricing 
or the financial viability of the incumbents is needed to have a penetration in terms of making a move there of 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, you're wrong. Five percent will do it. It's certainly 10 percent will do it because you price your services and your commodity on the margin. Now, this is my last slide. And what I will tell you is, is that what I really think we're facing here is not the clean versus dirty argument. This is not necessarily about climate change. Climate change is important. Climate change drove a lot of the subsidies, some of which still exist in, in my part of the industry today. And it will be addressed. But this is really about and what I want to have a debate is it's really about technology progression. It's a confluence of technologies coming together. Solar by itself does not do what I talk about here. Solar is too intermittent. Solar by itself cannot deliver the new services. Solar by itself cannot take the demand and the supply side and balance that out and basically create a nano grid that may not even need a cord at the end of the day. And we actually already have some customers in some of the islands that don't use the utility anymore because it was too expensive. And what does all of that mean? That means that the world may not look anything like what we think. <coughs> And I think now the progression and the psychology is, is that this is a linear movement, that the utilities will change a little bit on the margins. What if that's radically wrong? What if there, the utilities need to be deregulated, consumers need to have choices brought in, and that we look at this in a, in a fashion that says the industry doesn't in 10 years look anything like the industry we have now. It's coming. There's a lot of whispers behind. There's a lot of conversations that people don't want to have in front and public about how much penetration and how much change is happening on the monopolies. And what does that financially mean? So if you want to leave the system, do you have to pay to leave the system? If you wanted to cut your cord with AT&T to get a cell phone, did you wire money to AT&T or not? When I cut the cord for cable, did I wire some money to Comcast or not? And the answer, of course, is no. But how and what is the right balance to recognize that there, were, there are these systems out there that were created and funded but may no longer be viable? Look at the coal fleet. How many people really thought when you're out there fracking and really thought that we would see the decline of the coal fleet that we've seen in the last few years and even the President of the United States going up there and trying to do subsidies, mandates, that's not going to work. There's a lot of other things he's trying to do that's not going to work, but that's not going to work. <laughs> and even with the politics, let me tell you who's going to win. You're going to win. Consumers are going to win. Technology is going to win. And no amount of politicking is going to change that. You can bend the curve a little bit on the S-curve, but other than that, this is going to happen, and it is happening. Look at where we started with the traditional. We've moved up here. This is where we've been for the last few years, the Sonova Solar Service with the grid. We're just swinging it off. We're getting net metering. We don't have net metering with, uh, with Kenny's group, but that, that's okay. Um, actually, I think that will end up doing center point and the rest of Houston a lot of good, that we have a market-based approach. And actually, that question was only half right. Houston and Dallas have a market-based approach, but actually Austin and San Antonio don't. There are two very different regulatory <laughs> regimes. So kudos to Kenny and Centerpoint. Sonova uh, Solar and Storage Services, where we are now, we're going to put some intelligence in it. We're talking about control electronics and so forth. And then the last one is, and I'll say this, I don't think we end up here. I think we end up with a more of a telecommunications network that has you know, intelligence pushed to the endpoints of the system. So the trillion dollars that Matt spoke about, what if that's not in the poles and wires? What if that's actually done by a company like Sonova putting solar and storage and control electronics in the system, and that is the investment in the system? What about that? I'm sure we'll have some questions go through there. But if we could end up with a balance of centralized and decentralized, of wireless and wire, I think that's the best outcome for everybody in society as a whole. And I think that's the most likely outcome, but it will be dependent upon the politicians and the monopolies 
as to what that pricing looks like and what that path forward looks like to where we end up. And we could end up in a wireless, at least part, a major part of the customer base in the United States and in the world, it could end up wireless. It may certainly end up that way in developing countries such as those in Africa and some in Asia. You know, with that, I'll conclude. I will say this, that uh, in terms of the opportunities for Houston, for you all, our headcount growth is, is uh, up 20% this year. We're certainly hiring a number of very talented people all across the spectrum. There's a lot of exciting things going on. But we're also dependent upon you. A lot of the leadership in Houston is waking up. Finally, this is not a toy. This is not in terms of solar and storage and control electronics and the change in the energy business is not something that's predicated on a presidential or any other election. This is a fundamental shift that we're not only seeing in the U.S., but on a global basis. Get on board. Lead Houston to not only be the oil and gas capital of the world, but to be and truly maintain and extend our leadership to be the energy capital of the world. And we must do that, and we absolutely have all the talent in this room, outside of this campus, and in this city to make that happen. But we got to go out there, embrace the change, get excited, and go out there and make the things happen, and then come back in and say, we did it first, and we led the charge in Houston. So thank you very much, and I look forward to all the uh, questions and answers. So maybe what uh, if we can mix it up a little bit, and I know we've got a bunch of really good questions uh, uh, from the audience, but um, Kenny, maybe you can start off. You talked about more complicated, everything from power quality to reliability to resiliency to affordability. How do you do investment planning in a world that's changing as fast as the world that John just described? Yeah, it's, it's challenging, assuming this is still it's working. You're good. I think it's working. Uh, it's challenging because... Most of our investments are long-term investments. They're 20-plus year investments, right? So you, you got to factor all those variables into the, the investments that we have to give. All those variables matter. Um, the, the technologies that we're using today, we didn't, they weren't available three, three five, seven years ago. Um, so what we try to do, first and foremost, is focus on our customer needs. That's the first and foremost thing we do. Meeting this, the, the, the demand needs of the small residential customer, the commercial customer, the large industrial customer, uh, making sure we're sizing right to serve their needs and come online in the highest growth uh, area in probably in the U.S. We're seeing more growth in industrial, large commercial, small commercial, and residential than probably anywhere in, in the country. Since Harvey, it's just, it's just increased twofold from what it was uh, before Harvey. So, um, number one, we're focused on serving the needs of the customer uh, in, our, in our service area. Uh, secondly, we, we understand the importance of, of the, the resiliency in our service area because of the dangers and hazards of large events and Mother Nature. So we have to think about design differently. We can't just think of it like we did 30 years ago. We have to think about a more hardened approach, a more um, – it still has to be very affordable, very efficient, but you got to keep it out of the water. you got to keep it protected from the wind. You know, you know, some areas underground might make sense. Other areas underground doesn't make sense. So it's, a, it's really a balanced approach, um, trying to manage the needs of the customer and, the, and the, the, uh, the demands of technology that serve the customer uh, creates a lot of opportunities, really, a lot of good opportunities, and doing it in a, in a manner where we stay very focused on the strategy of, of investing in technology that's going to give us long-term, bi-directional capabilities so that you can have localized dispatch, if that's the case, and still have uh, the larger dispatch capabilities that happen with big natural gas and other types of matters. So the big wires still still come into play. They're still very important to us. Um, but we're, we're balancing that with a stronger distributed system, which years ago that wasn't the case. So our system is, is as important on the distribution side as it once was on the transmission side. And more and more of the future act activity will be driven through the distribution of our network. And so we're trying to, to do what we can to be in the 21st century uh, ahead of what's coming with our investments of today, 
so we can be well prepared for any other new emerging technologies like we saw earlier with batteries and, and the potential with microgrids and other things. So, um, Jesse, you were talking about sort of the challenges of integration and, 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 yet, and also the, you know, the, the success of financing, but how do you think about the future of financing solar in a world where maybe the utilities aren't, in fact, the same as they always were, right? What's the, what does that really look like? Because today it kind of depends on the utility balance sheet to pull, uh, to pull it off. How, how does that evolve in a world that's moving this fast and, frankly, where the technology is changing this quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, as, and, and I, I, I reckon the folks in the state would share this, share this opinion, you know, we're working in a very fast environment. Things are changing rapidly. And there's a lot of new, you know, technologies, products, etc. But I think fundamentally, you want to stay a conservative operator. You want to sort of understand what you're doing and... I'm you know, asking a question! So when we think of investments, we think of it exactly that way. And you know, um, try to create a box where you're looking at, you know, the longevity of the cash flows, the credit of the off takers, the sort of technology that you're banking on, and you're applying the really traditional project finance metrics to that. How long does it take for me to get my dollars out? And then what sort of a return am I getting on those? And are those by and large contracted? And then you kind of wrap in the technology that you're investing in, you know, how stable is that, what sort of warranties are around that, what sort of balance sheet is behind that. And all of that leads us to be able to be nimble and flexible to different state markets. In some state markets, we're selling to utilities the power. They're our clients. In some state markets, we're selling to residential entities and commercial entities. In some areas, we're selling to municipalities. And so already, we've got that flexibility built into our business model to be able to be in multiple different states, be able to operate many different size of assets, and be able to, to sort of be selling um, to different types of client credits and over different periods of time. So I don't see that changing dramatically if we're investing in solar or if we're investing in solar plus storage. We're just underwriting sort of the first deal for solar plus storage we're going to be investing in today. Or whether we're doing bifacial panels or something like that. And I think the investment community, you know, there's a lot of money in looking for good deals. And, you know, the newer, riskier stuff, it's going to come at a slightly higher cost of capital. And we'll have to give more of a return to our investors investors and the more stable stuff you know we'll be able to blend that return down and it'll be closer to sort of the the bond type of infra uh, returns that we're seeing now so i think that you know the investment community and the standards that are in place will allow for that sort of um, continued deployment of capital at greater scale by responsible entities as this market evolves john you put on the table the rise of batteries coming in at a, it's, it's like a coming in at a comet speed. I mean, it's just coming in at, at such a speed and scale that I don't think anybody anticipated the shape of that curve. And uh, How does that change? You, you talked about grid services. How does that change operationally the way the system should operate? And how the heck do you manage in a world that is changing, if you take that graph, you know, 100% a year, right? How, how does that change managerially? How does it change? How do you deal with regulators in a world that's changed that fast? How, how does that How does that change the world? Yeah, that that is a question, that, and uh, I don't know if this is on, but uh, that's a question that a lot of people are, re are wrestling with behind the scenes. Um, I think there's a general agreement that the current regulatory structure is broken. Uh, so the fact of the matter is there is a, and I spent some time at FERC, but there was a political compromise made back in the 90s, you're smiling, it, it, but basically at the substation, okay, you know, states, you have it, PUCs, public utility commissions, you have it, FERC, we have this, except in Texas, as Kenny said, we're all very unique, right? <laughs> Kenny. So, uh, you know, it, it, unfortunately, in this new environment, that doesn't, it never really made any sense. That really doesn't make any sense now. Uh, and Individual, go on to center point system, for instance, and do whatever the, whatever you wanted to. Is that really what we want? Can they all handle that? I would rather suspect no, not without a huge amount of money. So there's got to have to be some some people that have dollars on the line that are going to come in as service providers and say, we'll, we'll handle all this for you. But first, we've got to make sure that the regulatory system is open to that. So I'll give you a concrete example. 
I can aggregate my fleet today. I have thousands and thousands of customers in, in certain states. So let's call it Jersey. New Jersey is a, is a big one for us. And I could provide grid services uh, such as you know, ancillary services and so forth, and even wholesale power, if I were able to aggregate that up and anticipate the wholesale market. That, that's pretty difficult, if not impossible, in reality. The only place that you can really see a line of sight to do that is here in Texas, and specifically Houston and Dallas, not Austin and San Antonio. And so the problem there has been the prices. These guys do too good of a job keep the price low, and the cloud cover. Customers win. See, you're going to be a Sonoma fan before the night's over. You are here, you were before. But the price and the cloud covers here, the economics had to come in. And there's no net meter. There's never been any support for solar, residential solar, in Houston and in Dallas. And, and the reality is we're waiting on the battery prices to come down. And the battery opens up all these grid services that I'm talking about. So where are we going to go? Well, if you look at where Cal Iso and Governor Brown said that he wanted to do before he left, his office as governor of California, it is a possibility that the independent system operators and so forth can aggregate together and essentially take over distribution. That is one option, it is the quasi-nationalization of the, of the grid. Now remember, maybe most people don't know this, but unique, the United States is unique in that we have almost, depending on any county, 5,000 utilities. Most countries have like one to seven. So, when you look at that, this is an enormous opportunity for you. When you look at the midstream oil and gas business, there was a lot of aggregation, right? There was a lot of M&A activity. There was a lot of costs cut out of that system. And that's what needs to happen here on the poles and wires in the United States. I would prefer, this is why I think Centerpoint's in a great position. You know, I, I'm not just saying that because I like Kennedy's up on the stage, but I really do. <laughs> that... Companies like Centerpoint are allowed to come in there and buy large amounts of these utilities in exchange for cost reductions and so forth and different way of operating the system. I would prefer the private market approach, basically, much like what we have in oil and gas and away from the government approach. However, I think the jury's out as to which way we're going to go. And there may be a little bit different flavors between that, but I think that's largely the choice at hand. I've got a bunch more questions, but I think we have audience questions too. Obviously, you're a 